Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Timur Dumla. Uh, we're going to be talking about C23 today. Uh, this is an updated version of my uh, keynote at CppCon, which I gave a couple months ago. Uh, just to warn you all, this is actually a 90-minute talk, so I gave uh, I, I had permission from Jens to talk for a little bit longer today. So this is going to be a 90-minute talk. But if you do need to leave the room earlier because you didn't know it's going to be a 90-minute talk, then that's totally fine by me, um, just so that you know what's happening. Um, so this is going to be a talk about CSS23. Who am I? Why am I talking about C++? Um, I do three different things that have to do with C++. Uh, the most important one is, of course, my job. I work at JetBrains. I am a um, developer advocate at JetBrains. Um, we have lots of developer products such as C-Line, which is our C++ IDE, uh, ReSharp C++, which is our uh, Visual Studio plugin, and then also Rider, which is the IDE for .NET, and also for uh, Unreal Game Engine development. So we have a booth just right outside this room. Please come and check it out and talk to us. And also please come to um, the talk of my colleague, Anastasia Kazakova, tomorrow. Um, the other thing that I do that has to do with C++ is I worked in the audio industry, particularly the music production software industry, for about a decade. Had you know, many different jobs there. Uh, the last thing that I did was a few years ago, I co-founded a music tech company called Cradle, which is still active. We just released uh, this product just a few days ago. Uh, it's called The Spirit. It's a vocal processor. It sounds really cool. There's a lot of C++ going on under the hood there. And then the third thing that I do that has to do with C++ is I have been involved in the ISO C++ standards committee now since, I think, 2016. That's like six years. Um, so it's not quite as long as some other members of the committee, some of which have been uh, on the committee for over two decades. So I'm not one of those people with the gray beard that you, you see on, on those older pictures of the committee, but uh, you will find me on the on these ones, which are more recent, so this is when we completed C++ 17, and when we completed C++ 20, whenever you know, we're done with a new standard, every three years they take this group picture. Uh, this last one was from um, the Prague committee meeting in February 2020, organized by Hanna. Thank you very much. It was awesome. Um, and now we are actually very near another finalized release cycle with C++ 23. We're not quite there yet. So the Final meeting for C++23 is going to be in February in Issaquah, so we're just a few months away from um, finalizing C++23. Um, and C++23 at this point is already feature complete. So yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> Actually, since July this year, it's feature complete. We have a feature freeze, so now we're just fixing bugs, issues. Uh, we had a meeting. Uh, standards committee meeting just last week in this beautiful place, Kona, Hawaii. It was great. Uh, fixed a lot of issues in the standard. You think, it's, it, this is actually a picture from last week, you think, you know, how awesome is it to have a standards committee meeting in a tropical island in November? Well, let me tell you, it's not actually like this, because yes, it's like this outside, but, you know, what you're doing is you're stuck for six days in a, you know, windowless air-conditioned room talking about C++ wording, so... Don't really doesn't really matter whether it's on a tropical island or in Antarctica. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And also, they turn the AC to freezing. So, <laughs> oh well. Um, so yeah, we have another one of those um, in February, and then C++ 23 is going to be done. So we have um, a very very uh, good uh, image of what C++ 23 is going to look like. It's practically done. We're just ironing out a few last bugs. So it's a very good time to talk about C++ 23. And so I thought, OK, I want to talk about CSS23. How should I do this? And so um, I actually gave a talk here on this stage three years ago about C20. And what I did back then, I called it C20, the small things. So I talked about, I think, 20 or even 25 different features. It was a little bit of a firehose talk about like all the different small features that, that C20 had. Um, and it was a fun talk, but it was kind of not very deep because you don't really have time to go into a lot of depth with, with these features. And so um, I, I wanted to do something different. So um, one year later, two years ago, here at this conference, that was the, um, hang on, 
let me let me tell you this first. So um, I'm kind of interested more in in kind of these. Uh, deep uh, features that really change what we do with the language. And, and so, so the way I, I see C++ is kind of like a, like a toolbox. So you have your saws there, you have your hammers, you have your screwdrivers, and then if you look at the screwdrivers, you have your uh, you know, Phillips screwdrivers, you have the uh, slot screwdrivers, you have the, um, I don't know, Torx screwdrivers, and then somebody goes ahead and invents the pentalobe screwdriver, which is really good for turning pentalobe screws. And, it feels to me that, that this is kind of a lot of the features we add to the standard are kind of like this. They're like very specialized things uh, to do a very specialized thing. And if you have exactly that problem, uh, you're going to reach for it. And it's good. You know, pentalobe screwdrivers are useful. But um, that's kind of not really what I'm interested in. What I'm, in. what I'm interested in is kind of like those things like the cordless electric screwdriver, right? So you can just grab one of those. And instead of turning the screw with your hand, you can now just go and that's it, right? And so. A lot of people are going to find that useful. It doesn't matter what you're trying to do or what kind of screw you're trying to turn. That's going to have a huge impact on, on how you write C++. And so um, one year later, that was the first uh, pandemic version of meeting C++, I gave this talk about C++20, uh, which I named How C++20 Changes the Way You Write Code. And today, I shamelessly stole the title for that talk for this talk, except I said it's 23 now. Um, so in that talk, I talked about just four features, the four big features of CFSS 20, coroutines, concepts, ranges, and modules. And so uh, those four features, they really very fundamentally change uh, the way we write code, the way we think about C++, right? Because these four features change how we think about functions, how we think about uh, templates, how we think about algorithms and how we think about compiling and deploying our code, right? So these are very, very fundamental things that every C++ developer has to do. And so um, today, I want to talk about CSS 23. So we don't quite have features of that magnitude in C++ 23. But we do have features that will have a huge impact on, on the average C++ developer. So I want to. I want to see what those are. And maybe we can find, similarly to what I did two years ago, we can find four features that are going to be really impactful. So let's go in and look at what's there. So if you go to CPP reference, I'm sure some of you have seen this or are familiar with this. Uh, CPP reference has this page, which is called C++ compiler support, where it lists what features of every standard are supported by which compiler. And there's this really long list. So, so here for C++23, this is the list for core language features and you know, which compiler which implements which. And so it's quite a long list. You know, Even though C++23 is kind of a smaller release than C++20, the list is actually quite long. And then there's another list with uh, C++23 library fun functions. So this is everything that's new in the C++23 standard library. And it's an even longer list. right? It's really quite a long list. And, and if you uh, zoom out, you see how long the list actually is. So that's all the new stuff. And if you just look at the leftmost column, then you just get basically a list of all the new features. And I can kind of take that and explode that into a slide. Exceptionally, it doesn't, it doesn't really fit on a slide, actually. So it fits on three slides. This is one slide with all the new um, language stuff. And then we have two slides, one and two, with all the new library stuff. Right. So that's quite a lot. It's definitely um, more than I could talk about uh, in any talk definitely a 90 minute talk. So what we need to do is we need to kind of reduce that list down until we have a shorter list of the actual things that we want to talk about that are going to be really, really impactful. So let's try and do this. Let's try and reduce this list. So this is the list of language features. And let's just go ahead and remove everything that's kind of a deprecation, undeprecation, removal of something, or clarification of something. Um, and let's just get rid of that. And then let's do the same um, for the standard library stuff. So page one, page two. So our list got a little bit shorter. And then um, we're going to go back to the first uh, slide of the library features and remove everything where something just got kind of tweaked. Uh, we added a no except here. We added a const expert there. We added like a 
new constructor somewhere. You know, these are good additions, but they're not really big, impactful features. They're kind of tweaks. So I want to just not talk about that today in this talk, because this talk is about impactful, uh, big features. So let's remove that, and also on the second page. And, and then um, there is a huge uh, kind of bucket of features, which is everything that has to do with ranges. So on the first page, and here even more on the second page, you see quite a lot of stuff has been added to ranges. We actually have a study group just for ranges on the, um, on the committee, and they have done fantastic work. So uh, ranges got, got a, lot more, a lot more features in CSS 23. But I'm not a ranges expert, so I would say it's kind of its own kind of subset of the language, which is really interesting, but it deserves its own talk. I'm not really a ranges expert, and also arguably it's great, but it's kind of adding to something that we added ranges in C++ 20, so it kind of expands on something that we started in 20. It's not completely new, right? It's like an addition. So let's remove all the, all the ranges-related stuff. And then there's another big bucket of features um, in the language, which is um, there's been a lot of work going on um, about text encoding and Unicode, all of those things. So we also have a study group for that, um, SG16, and they have done fantastic uh, work um, as well. Um, I hear that we still don't quite got it right, so there's still some things about Unicode and text that don't quite uh, uh, work, but you know, we're getting there. Um, a lot of um, people are Unicode experts or character encoding experts um, on the committee. Here's one of those people, uh, Corentin. Um, if you don't know who that is, he gave a, a fantastic talk actually at CBPCon 2019. This is a, just a five-minute lightning talk about text, which is fantastic. Um, it's one of my favorite lightning talks of all time, so um, I recommend you watch it if you want to watch something fun in five minutes. This is really cool. And uh, in that five-minute talk, he managed to convince me that um, A, text is really hard, and B, you know, we still, we still uh, didn't quite get it right. So um, I don't think it's time yet to talk about text in C++ um, in a talk like this. And you know, if it was, I, I wouldn't be uh, a good person to do this. I think Quarantine would be a much better person to do this. So, so let me just go ahead and, and not talk about the text stuff now, even though there's some really good stuff in there. And so um, there's other uh, features that, that we, we got in C++23 that are also kind of improvements of existing features, right? So, not really completely new stuff. So there's things like um, class template argument deduction, which now works with inherited constructors. So if you're inheriting constructors, you don't need to write deduction guides anymore, and you get them for free. Or lambdas, for example. Uh, you know how if you don't have parameters, you don't have to write the paren paren, but if you have mutable, then you do. So now you don't anymore. So you know all these like improvements of existing features, which you will kind of discover along the way as you use them. So again, I wouldn't say they're like massive, impactful features. They're kind of improvements. So um, I'm not going to talk about any of those today, even though it's really good stuff. And so uh, also for the standard library, uh, I'm not going to talk about anything where we added functionality to like an existing class or an existing facility, even though it's great, but it's not completely new. So let me remove uh, those things and also on the second page. Um, and now um, you see the list got quite a lot shorter. So now actually everything fits on one slide. So, so this is the slide. And, and now those are the features that are really completely new, like not additions or improvements, but completely new features in CSS 23. And so this list is still a bit too long, so, so let me try and whittle down the list a little bit further. So um, hash warning, hash elif dev, hash elif dev, they're new in C++23, but compilers have supported them for ages, so arguably not completely new. Um, labels at the end of compiled statements, it's kind of a C compatibility feature, not gonna talk about that. If const eval, arguably kind of a bit of a cleanup from C++20 where we introduced to this constant evaluated, but it's kind of a bit weird, so, so this is better. Um, literal suffix for size t, yeah, this is cool. We now have a suffix where you can write a size t literal uh, for signed and unsigned, and it's z and uz, so that's that. We talked about it, it's good. Um, requirements for optional extended floating point, oh, this is a cool one. So um, 
we now have std float 16t and std float 32t and float 64t, so like fixed size floating point types. So it's a little bit like the fixed size integer types, like std buint 64 underscore t or something like this, except um, so for floating point types and except the integer ones, they can be type defs. These are guaranteed to be uh, their own type. So really cool for numeric stuff, uh, excellent material for a numerics talk. That's not today's talk. And then there's auto paren x and auto curly x, which I looked at that and I thought, um, ooh, this is kind of a weird, I don't quite understand this. This seems to be kind of a very niche expert, expert feature. But then it was pointed out to me that this is actually really cool and it opens up API design in very, very interesting ways. And I was like, huh, I need to look into this. But um, I don't quite understand, um, you know, the kind of how you would use this um, in API design. So um, I think I need to catch up on that and maybe mention it in, in another talk. So also not going to talk about this. Attribute assume, um, this is something that's very close to my heart. I have spent three years standardizing this. It was hard, but we got it in C++ 23. So this is basically a feature where you can say assume expression and then the, uh, the, the compiler can assume that this expression is true without checking it and then optimize based on that assumption. So that's a very cool feature if you write very low latency, high performance code and you just squeeze the you know, last nanoseconds of performance out of this particular a uh, piece of code where the compiler, the optimizer, doesn't quite understand what it is that you want. So this is now kind of a portable way to do this. It's cool, but it's also very, very dangerous, right? So you can easily just introduce undefined behavior into your program and then everything goes off the rails and you get super weird stuff. So it's a very sharp knife that you need to be careful with. And there's also this um, feature, stood unreachable, which is kind of related. Um, so this is really cool, but it's, again, a very, very specialized expert-only feature, which is very easy to misuse, and so I don't think most developers should ever look at those, so I'm not gonna talk about them t today, even though, even though I, I like that and I've worked on that myself. Um, so, and then these ones here are also new uh, features which are not dangerous or you know, expert only necessarily, but they're very specialized. They're like these, uh, like the pantalope screwdriver, yeah? So you will reach for them. If you have this very specific uh, problem, uh, you will reach for that specific tool. But I would say most developers will probably not have to deal with most of those. So, so you're going you're gonna, to like look, reach for them and, and look them up you know, if and when you need them. But um, not for today, and, and so this is what we're left with. I think these are like the really big new features in C++23. This is kind of the meat. And so we're getting closer to our kind of four features that, that we want to talk about today. I know it's a very long intro, but bear with me. So um, this is kind of the meat. Um, how, do we, how do we approach this? So uh, we have standard library modules here, and we have the generator, so obviously those are both Pretty awesome, but also those are kind of stuff we should have done in C++20, right? So standard library modules, it's awesome. Daniela talked about this earlier today. It's great, but it's kind of, you know, we should have done this when we introduced modules. Um, and the generator, also some, you know, first rudimentary library support for coroutines, in particular for this generator use case, which we really should have done with uh, C++20. So I've been, we're now kind of catching up, um, adding support for stuff in C++ here that we added in C++ 20. So not really something completely new, even though it's very cool and very important. And then also these, um, I would say um, they're great libraries. And if you, if you, so you have step trace library, move only function, and those um, kind of contiguous layout um, associative containers, flat map and flat set, they're very good if you want to be you know, cache friendly. So um, those are very good libraries, and you will reach for them when you need them, but they're kind of self-contained. They're like this thing. They're not really touching other parts of the language too much. So um, I'm going to talk about those, and I'm going to talk about the remaining four. So now you're left with four features, and I would say that these, they really have a lot of you know, consequences. You know? they, they, they're interesting in a sense that they're touching different parts of the language, different use cases, and I think those are the four features that are going to be most impactful and significant for the average C++ developer. So these are the four that we're going to talk about for the rest of this talk. 
Let's dive in and talk about the first one, which is deducing this. So deducing this is by far the biggest um, language feature that is new in C++23. It's a paper that's been in development for a while. This is the actual uh, proposal. Uh, so Ben, uh, ben Dean, one of the co-authors, told me that he was thinking about something like this since C++20, sorry, since 2013, and then there were a couple other people who were thinking about a similar problem around the same time, and they teamed up and they started working on this. So this feature has been gestating for quite a while, and finally we got it in a standard. Uh, so Ben, one of the co-authors, actually gave a fantastic talk um, at CppCon uh, last year, which is called Deducing This Pattern, which is one hour just about deducing this. So this is, as of right now, I think the ultimate reference for this. So if you want to know more, watch this. Um, I don't have a whole hour to talk just about this feature, so I'm going to be you know, not quite as exhaustive as Ben was, but hopefully I can get across why deducing this is cool, what you can use it for, why, why it's important for you. So this is a quote by Bjarne uh, Struustrup, the creator of C++. Uh, when you consider whether you know, something is a good addition to the standard, his rule of thumb was it's a good feature proposal if it solves at least two unrelated problems at the same time. And it turns out deducing this solves at least three problems at the same time, and maybe four or five. So it looks like it's a really, really good, it really kind of matches that, that requirement. You know, that's a pretty high bar, but, but that definitely, definitely matches it. So that's, that's a good addition to the standard. So what is deducing this? How does this work? Uh, let's observe that if we have a class, um, it has member functions, and we can overload a member function on whether or not the object itself, the, the this, right, uh, whether or not that's const. Okay, so that's hopefully not surprising to anybody in this room. Um, you can overload on whether this is const or non-const. Um, something slightly more subtle, something that we can do since C++11 is that we can overload a member function on whether uh, the object itself, the this that you call this member function on, um, is an L value or an R value, right? So these are these ref qualifiers that we have since C++11. And we can actually overload also on uh, all combinations of those, right? Ref, const ref, 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 const ref, ref. There's also volatile, which probably most people don't need, but you can uh, uh, overload on those, on those things. And so um, what deducing this gives you, like the, the first level, is that it just gives you a different syntax to write the same thing. So with deducing this, exactly the same thing would be written like this. So observe that on the left, it's kind of a little bit weird, right? So you are talking about the this pointer, which is kind of the, the implicit first parameter of every member function. But the way you specify whether it's ref or const ref or whatever, it's kind of this weird syntax with the thingies at the end, right? Um, so, so with the new syntax on the right-hand side, you make this implicit first parameter of every member functions, you make it an explicit parameter, and you write this as the actual first parameter of the function signature, and to distinguish it from a normal parameter, you put the this uh, keyword in the beginning, and then the rest is just normal parameter declaration syntax. And so, so this is just, just a different syntax for the thing on the left, uh, where you make the this uh, uh, parameter explicit. And because now we're using just regular parameter declaration syntax, we can give this parameter a name. We can name it self, for example. That's what Python people do. That's, that's cool, right? But you can name it whatever. Self is just a good convention. And because it's just function declarations and dikes, if you want to, um, you can do something really cool. And this is the bit that you couldn't do before. Instead of writing out four overloads, you can actually template on what the type of this actually is. And then it looks like that. Right? So now, instead of having four overloads, you have one template. And then you can call it with a const object or a non-const object or whatever, and it's going to deduce you know, what the type actually is for you using ju just the normal rules of function template argument deduction, the ones that we had since the 90s. Didn't change them. Uh, but now you can deduce the type of this using, using function template uh, parameter deduction. Um, and so because it's just a function template. You can also use this alternative syntax here, which we got in C++20. If you don't need to name the type, you can just write auto. And so, so this, is, this is what deducing this is. And now let's look at what you can do with it, because it's really cool. It's, it's kind of a 
very small addition to the specification if you look in the wording of the standard, but it has all these wide-reaching consequences. It kind of ripples through the whole language and lets you do all of these cool, cool new things. And so one kind of very obvious thing is that it gets rid of duplication, or in some cases, actually quadruplication. So what you have to do in C++ 20 and before, a lot of the time, you actually have to write out these overloads. And so, for example, this is something you hit when you implement something like optional. It has a um, member function value, which returns the value of the object that's stored inside the optional. And it's kind of really just one function that does one thing, but because you have all these different cases, uh, you know, L value, R value, const, non-const, and uh, the return value needs to be different in every case, you end up writing out these four overloads, right? And so you end up duplicating or quadruplicating essentially the same function body four times, which is not good. We don't like that, right? But it turns out in C++ 20, there isn't really a good way to, to remove this quadruplication, right? So what we could do is instead of writing the same function four times, you can write it once, and then the other three call the fourth. But then because the parameter types don't match and return types don't match, you have to use these really ugly casts, and it's really ugly. And so the other thing you can do is you can um, factor it out into a private implementation function, and then you, you call this from, from the other four, which is also kind of not great. Um, or another thing that you can do, which is probably what most people end up doing, is you just omit some of these four. You just don't, don't implement all four of them, and then that's really the worst option, because then you sacrifice either const correctness or you sacrifice um, performance, because you're going to make unnecessary copies if you didn't implement the move variations, or you sacrifice both const correctness and performance if you just implement you know, one. And so, so um, this is not good, but in C++23, we don't have to worry about this anymore. We don't have to do it like this anymore, because we can just template on the type of this, and we can write one implementation, which is now a template, and that's going to cover all of those cases. Right? You can write a generic implementation, and whether or not it's ref or ref ref or const or non-const, it's just going to work in all these cases. Right? And so here you have this uh, deduce, deduced this uh, uh, parameter here. So um, that's cool. There's another thing that this allows you to do. It makes CRTP a lot simpler. So CRTP is the QSD recurring template pattern. And I'm sure many of you have heard about this. It's been around for a while. It's one of those really weird things that you have to get your head around when you, when you, learn, when you learn C++. So it's been around since the 90s. Um, I think the term CRTP was actually coined by Jim Copeland in 95. The concept is not even exclusive to C++. It's been around since the 80s. Um, if you, like, type theorists know about this, it's called F-bounded polymorphism. So it's basically a generic type that's parameterized on the type that it actually is. So that's kind of what it is in type theory. Um, and we have it in C++, and, and um, it's useful. So I'm just going to talk quickly about the classic CRTP pattern. Um, let's say you have um, a type counter, which under the hood, it's just an integer, but you don't want it to be an integer. You want it to be a strong type with a strongly typed interface. So you, you hide the integer somewhere in the private section, and you have like get value and set value, and you make it a class type. Okay? And so, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. And, and then you say, okay, well, it's a counter. I want to be able to increment it. And so you add these uh, increment operators here, and you implement them. Um, and, then, um, and then you can use it, right? So you have, uh, you have this counter. You can now increment it using prefix or postfix increment operators, and you can get the value out. Okay? So that's very easy. Now, let's say we have a completely unrelated class, which is also some kind of strong type def for an integer. Let's call it age. Maybe we have a class that represents an age of a person, and it has a slightly different interface. It has like a different integer type under the hood, and maybe it has a constructor. You can initialize it with the value, whatever. Um, but it, you can also increment it, right? So every time somebody has a birthday, you increment the age. So you have the same uh, increment operators, right? So you have this, this duplication here. You, inc you implement the same stuff. And so um, CRTP gives us a way to get rid of this duplication, right? So what you can now do is you can factor this out into, into a base class. And you don't want to have like a classic virtual like runtime polymorphism inheritance hierarchy here because those classes are completely unrelated. 
but, but you still want to somehow factor this out into uh, a base. So what you can do is you can do the CRTP mix-in where you have a, uh, a base class that is templated on the type that's going to be deriving from it. Right? And then you, you, you stick the implementation of these uh, operators in there. So now we have this incremental base class. It's templated on what's going to be deriving from it. And then, and then in, the, in the count when age classes, we have to do this weird thing where uh, we have to derive it from incrementable, and we have to pass the derived class down to the base class as a, as a template argument, right? So it's kind of a bit weird, so I could never remember when I was learning this, like, is the base templated on the derived, or is the derived templated on the base? It's kind of a bit unintuitive. Um, and so the other thing, um, if you want to access anything from the derived class and the base class, you can do it. So it's a little bit like, like virtual functions, but it's all at compile time. And in order to make this work, you have to write this weird incantation with the static cast to derived. And I'm sure you've, you've seen this. And so, so um, it works. You know, we've been using it since the 90s. Um, but it's, it's, it's not ideal, right? So um, there's actually a bug on this slide. Can somebody tell me where the bug is? Yes. Very well spotted, sitting in the first row. Um, yes, so we, we copy-pasted the code, and, and we just accidentally um, we just derived from the wrong. We passed the wrong derived class down to the base class, right? And so, and so that's going to compile. OK? It's going to run. It's probably not going to do what you want, because it's undefined behavior. OK, so not great. You can get around this. You can, you can like, um, make the constructor of the base class private and make the derived thing a friend and you can do all of these things. But like, overall, if you consider like, the last 10 slides or so, like, the ergonomics of this feature are not great. I think we would probably all agree on that. Um, and so, so um, let's see what this would look like with deducing this. Um, so with deducing this, um, we can now um, make this uh, make the, the this parameter explicit, right? So we can we can do this thing. We can uh, write this auto self, and now that's the this object here. And uh, so the cool thing about this, this is really important, is that the what deducing this does, it deduces the most derived like actual type, um, full, like the most derived type that's fully known at compile time. So if it knows at compile time that this is actually going to be a derived, like a counter on H, that's the type that's going to derive, right? So it's going to derive the fully uh, uh, derived type. Uh, sorry, deduce, that's the word. It's going to deduce, the template argument action is going to deduce the fully derived type. So it's going to deduce counter or H. And that means you don't need to write this weird incantation anymore. You don't have to study cast it to derive because it's already derived. Template argument action already deduced that type for you. So that's really, really important. And so then, we don't need the template stuff anymore. This all just goes away. We don't need to template anything on anything anymore. And now it just looks like this. Right? So it's a lot easier. Um, and, so, um, and so, yeah, we don't need this template stuff anymore. Like, this whole CRTP thing just goes away. And you can just, just write a member function that gives you a pointer to this, which is the fully derived type, and then you just use it. Okay? So that's a lot easier. So. Um, there are a couple of things about this. There's, there's one thing in particular I want to mention that Ben, ben Dean didn't mention in his CppCon talk, which is um, what this lets you do is it lets you actually now um, have a, a, re, a, a reference to base class. And you can, you can bind uh, an object of derived to a reference to base. So you cannot do this with CRTP, because the CRTP, the base class, is a template, right? So with this, you can write this. And it's kind of weird, because it looks like runtime polymorphism, right? It looks very much like this is a polymorphic object, but it's not, right? Because it's compile time polymorphism. And so this looks like virtual function polymorphism, but it's, it's not, and it's not going to work. And so if you try to increment like, the, the reference to, to base, it's, 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 it's going to give you a compiler error. Um, so, you know, the type theorist would say that f bound, like uh, deducing this um, replaces uh, intrusive uses of f bounded polymorphism, which is where you use the derived functionality from inside the class, but it doesn't replace 
uh, kind of non-intrusive usages where you deduce, where you use the de derived functionality from the outside. So that just won't work. Um, so you know, there maybe there is a way to to kind of make that not compile at compile time, maybe with some concept stuff. Like, not yet sure what the best way is to do that. I would I would say the best practice on this is still emerging, but I think it's kind of a bogus argument. I don't think this is a problem because. Um, you wouldn't use incrementable as a base class. Right? You, wouldn't, you wouldn't pass a reference to incrementable uh, in, into a function because it's not, it's not a base class in the sense that animal and cat and dog are, right? There, it's just a bag of functionality. And the fact that counter derives from incrementable is just an implementation detail. So incrementable would probably live somewhere in a detail namespace or something like that. So I don't think, I don't think this is a problem. But it's good to be aware of that, that, that you, know, you can form this reference, but it's actually not going to do anything useful. And so there's, there's other stuff you can do with deducing this, which is really cool. You can, um, you can put a concept in there, so you can uh, constrain a member function on the type of the class itself that it's a member function of. This is not something you can do with C++20. The other thing you can do is you can pass this by value to its own member functions. That's also pretty cool. So Ben talks a little bit more in his talk about that. Like both of those things, they enable like really cool new kind of programming patterns that I don't have time to talk about now. But if you're curious, check out Ben, ben, ben Dean's talk. And I think by now there's probably a few more or like blog posts on the topic somewhere. So it's really cool. Um, I want to talk today um, about another thing that um, using this lets you do. It lets you write recursive lambdas. And how cool is that? All right, so, so let's talk about why you can't really do this today or how you can do this today. So let's, let's go with factorial. That's like the canonical recursive function, I guess. Don't actually implement factorial in this way, obviously, but I think it's a good example. So here's a naive implementation of factorial with a lambda. Does this compile? Does this work? No, why not? Um, so, yeah, the compiler error is um, you cannot use f from inside its own initializer. You haven't defined f yet, so you can't use f to initialize f, right? So you can't do that, um, which is unfortunate. Um, we can get around it. Like, how could we get around this in C20? Any ideas? Okay, that's the advanced version. There's a much simpler way we can do this. We can, we can make it a std function. So that works, right? You can, you can declare a function and then capture it by reference and then use it inside the lambda. That works. It's not great, right? Because that function has all this overhead. Like it, it's, it's a big, it's a function, ob it's an object, right? So it might, it has all this type erasure machinery inside. It might allocate memory. I mean, in the, probably not in this case, but um, it's probably not a good solution. It's like overhead that you don't need. But uh, you can do what the gentleman in the back said. You can make it a parameter. So uh, you, can, um, you cannot refer to the lambda from inside the lambda body, but you can parameterize the, the lambda on the function that's going to be calling recursively, OK? And then you can pass the lambda to itself as that parameter, OK? So that works in C20. Um, but it's kind of weird, right? So now you have to. Um, uh, you have to. You can't just make it a normal function call. So you have to call the lambda and pass the lambda itself into itself. You can you can actually factor this out, and you can you can do another lambda which does that for you. Then you get what's called a Y combinator. But then you need this extra helper to do that. So it's n not really great. But you probably see where this is going now, right? So, so if you have deducing this, we don't have to have an explicit parameter to pass the lambda to itself, because we have the this parameter, which already is the lambda, right? Because a lambda, it's a closure type that the compiler generated for you. The closure type is just a class type. Uh, the, the body of the lambda is operator paren paren, the call parameter, which is just a member function of that class type, which the compiler generated for you. Because it's just a member function of a class type, you can obviously pass the object itself to its member function using this new syntax. And now this is just a normal function call, and this just works. How cool is that? It's cool, right? Now you, you, you could say, OK, this is just a toy example. Like, Why would we ever want to do this in practice? Well, 
Here's an example, actually, again, from Bendin's talk, um, which I find really cool. Um, here's, here's a use case. So let's say, and this is classic C++ job interview question. Let's say uh, we want to do tree traversal. So we have a binary uh, a tree, uh, which we're going to implement just with the variant, right? So every, every tree is either a leaf or, an, you know, sorry, or, or a node with like a left tree and a right tree, and then it's kind of recursive. So we would just want to now recursively uh, traverse this tree. And so uh, what we can do is we can do this trick, which um, I've talked about in my Lambda, uh, Lambda idioms talk, and it's on the CPP reference, and I'm sure some of you have seen this. It's kind of, by now, relatively popular idiom. So what you can do is you can have this overload set where you inherit from a bunch of functions, and then you make those functions base classes. So you, you kind of have a variadic pack of, of base classes. And then that's an aggregate, right? Because it has nothing else in there. So it's just an aggregate, and the base classes are the elements. So you can initialize with aggregate initialization with the curly braces. And then you inherit the call operator from all of, the, of these base classes. So you get this overload set. And so uh, we create an over, and, and if you create an overload set, that's really good for std variant, right? So we can do std visit on a std variant and give it an overload set. And that's going to call the correct overload on the correct type, depending on what variant is at the time, right? And so we can create this overload set and give it two lambdas, one for leaves and one for nodes, and leaves just, it's just one leaf, it just counts it. And the node version recurses into the subtrees and calls itself recursively. And then in the end, you get this uh, recursive tree traversal here. And uh, the, the important thing is why this works is because uh, here, um, in this overload for, for node, so we do this uh, deducing this thing, but deducing this is going to de deduce the fully derived type. So the type of this const auto self in this lambda is not going to be the lambda, it's going to be the whole thing, the whole overload set. Okay, that's going to be the type. And so if we call it recursively down there, it's gonna, it's gonna call the whole overload set, and so if it's a leaf, it's gonna call the leaf version recursively. So um, that's why this works. Is this? Well, that's clear. Okay, this is cool. So, so next time you you're interviewing for a C++ job and somebody asks you to implement tree traversal, you can do this and really impress your interviewer. However, if you if you do want to do this, I recommend you have a cutting edge compiler that can actually compile this. Um, I think as of right now, only the Microsoft compiler can do this. Um, like neither GCC nor Clang implement this yet, but hopefully they will be because it's now in the new standard. All right. Give me a second. So we come to the second part. I'm going to talk about std expected. Std expected is also really, really cool. So this is also a paper that has been in, in development for quite a while, and it, um, it went through 12 revisions. The first version of this paper was seen by the C++ committee in 2016, I think. But the idea is actually much older. It, it comes from a uh, talk by Andre Alexandrescu from 2012. Um, and so, so the reason it's really important, I think, is because um, error handling is one of those cross-cutting concerns. You know, it's like logging, error handling. There's a handful of those where, like, every project has to deal with error handling at some point. Right? Every developer has to deal with error handling at some point. So you need to like really think about how you want to do this because it's, it's really very, very difficult to kind of put that into your project like after the fact. And so we have a few mechanisms for error handling in C++. There have been countless talks at this conference and other conferences given about different kinds of error handlings and all the trade-offs. So I'm not going to rehash this whole discussion, but I think it's that expected really plays an interesting role. Like it occupies like a very interesting uh, spot in this space of how do we do error handling in C++. And now we have it in the standard. So I think, I think it's, it's really cool. So let's, let's do like a quick overview of like how is it expected fits into the, the picture here. So let's say we have a function which is going to um, uh, parse a string and then, and then parse like a string that represents a floating point number. And it's going to parse that string and return the number. Okay? Very easy. Maybe you need that if you're implementing like a lexer for a programming language or you know, a calculator or whatever. So, so this is our function here. It gets a string view and it gives you a double back. Okay, very easy. We're not going to implement the functionality ourselves. You're going to use std str 
which is the function that actually does the thing, uh, except it has like a bit of an awkward interface, but so we're gonna just wrap it basically here. So if you haven't heard about the stir tort, now you have. It does exactly this. You give it a string, it gives you back a double, okay? So, so this is our function, and then uh, if you wanna use it, we're just gonna call it on a string, and we get the number back, and we, we print it, okay? Now obviously this string is not a number, okay? As you see, it's, it's not a number. So what's gonna happen? What is this actually going to print? Anybody knows? Exception. Sorry, what? Exception. No. Is that a no. no. Zero. Zero, exactly. Stood stir toward. If it, if it doesn't know, if it, if it can't pass the string, it just returns zero. So th this is gonna print zero. And so now we don't have any idea whether it printed zero because the string actually contains a zero or whether it printed zero because you put a wrong string in there, right? So we need to do some error handling. So the default mechanism for error handling in C++ is exceptions. That's what, you know, every, that's like Bjarne recommends, that's what a lot of other books recommend. This is the default mechanism we have for error handling in C++. So let's do this with exceptions. So, um, so Stutzstert actually has this weird interface, like it, it actually, um, if, uh, if it didn't pass, so it gives you back kind of the, the, the beginning of the string and the end of the string when it was done parsing. And if those are the same, then it didn't do any parsing. So that's the way you figure out that something went wrong in there. So you can compare begin and end, and if they're the same, you know, okay, there was an error in there, so you can throw an exception. And then there's actually another error that uh, can happen. Uh, your number, your string, can be just too, too big. It, and it's not gonna fit into double. You can write 1E900999, e right? And that's not a number that fits into the type double. And then you get another error, uh, so sort of returns the special value huge val, um, and you can also capture that, and you can throw another exception, right, if that happens. And then on the uh, user side, you have to wrap this whole thing into a try block, and then you have to catch different exceptions, and you can handle them, okay? So this is, I mean, you all know how to do this. So on the one hand, this is great, right? Because you have the happy path and the error path like nicely separated. Um, you can also like, you know, if you don't do the try catch here, um, you know, it's gonna be, you can handle it, you can throw it like, unwind the stack, it can be handled somewhere else, uh, further up the call stack. So this is really great for cases where something exceptional happens and you need to like stop whatever you're doing and you know, just do something else, abort everything. Um, this is great. Um, however, in this case, this is probably not an exceptional thing. This is probably something that's gonna happen quite often, right? It's not really an exception. It's more like something that can happen in your code, right? So you don't want to pay uh, all this overhead because um, exceptions, they don't have typically on modern platforms any runtime overhead on the happy path, but they do have an overhead, a significant overhead in both runtime and also binary size um, if, you do, if you do have an exception, right? So, so you have to store all this information for unbinding the stack, so your binary gets big, so it's a problem on embedded systems if you want to have a small binary size. And also, the error path is gonna be really slow because um, and storing an exception is a dynamic memory allocation, right? So you can also not do this, for example, if you, if you do some low latency stuff or real-time stuff, you can't call stuff where, which allocates memory, right? So, and you want to do this if, if something bad happens and you need to give up, but in this case, it's just normal usage. So you don't want to pay for this overhead. And on some systems, you can't. Actually, uh, surveys uh, consistently say that about half of all C++ developers don't use exceptions either in some parts of their code or nowhere in their code, right? So exceptions have downsides, and you know, obviously what we can do is we can do what the C people do. We can uh, return an error code. Right, um, and then uh, it's kind of nice because it forces you to check for the error, right? And it, there's no runtime overhead here anymore. This is like the maximally efficient solution. Uh, so you check for the error code, and if, the, if there's no error code, if the return value is okay, then you can, you can do your thing. But it's kind of weird, right? Because um, now um, the error handling takes over the function signature, right? So the return value is now just the error code, and the actual return value is encoded in this in-out parameter. So you have to create the double first and then pass it in by non-const reference and then 
So it's kind of this really weird, awkward interface. So in C++ uh, 17, we got set optional. Set optional is, in my opinion, much, much better, much cleaner. And set optional is um, great if you have either a value or you don't. And the reason why you don't have a value is either obvious or unimportant. Right? So, so in all of those cases, set optional is fantastic. It's not really a good error handling mechanism, though, and we're gonna, we're gonna see why. So here, instead of returning a double, we're returning an optional double, so this is now a very clean function signature again. And then on the uh, usage side, we have to take this optional, we have to check if there's a value in there, and if there is, we dereference it, we get the value out, if there isn't, we do our error handling. So, uh, you know, it is, it is nice and clean. Um, however, um, we now lost the information about the error. Here, there's two different things that can happen, but the only thing we can do um, if something goes wrong is you can just return an empty optional, right? So that's the error state. So we don't have a way to propagate which of these two errors actually happened, but maybe you want to let your users know, you know, was it an overflow or was it an invalid string? And with an optional, you can't do this. And, and this is where expected comes in. So if you return an expected, so where optional is either a value or nothing, and expected is either a value or an error, okay? So now we're returning an expected, and um, it's actually very similar to an optional in, in the, way, the way you use it. So if you want to construct one with a value, uh, you have this implicit conversion from value to expected, so there's no syntactic overhead for the happy path. You just return your value. And then for the error path, there is a little bit of syntactic overhead. You have to then, if you want to construct an error, you explicitly uh, have to uh, construct it with still unexpected. I should also say that the error, the, te the second tab name parameter, is not, doesn't have to be um, an exception type. It can be any type. It can be a string or, or something else. It, it just can't be a void. Um, and so you create the error uh, version with the unexpected. And then on the user side, it's very similar to optional. You can compare it to bool. You can convert it to bool. And if it's true, there is a value inside. You can dereference it. But if there isn't, you now have this new uh, function called dot error, which, with which you can get the error out. Right? And now you can do the error handling like this. And so, so this is the API. You can construct it with the value. You can construct it with just the default constructor, and it's going to give you a default constructed value. And then you can construct the error state with um, unexpected. Um, and then this is all the same as with optional. You have uh, operator bool. You have dot has value, which is the same. Um, and then you have, you can dereference it, you can do dot value, you can do uh, dot value or. Um, that's all the same as with optional, but you also now have this uh, new thing here, uh, dot error, which lets you get the error out. Okay. And so this is, I think, very straightforward. And um, actually, this is such an obvious thing that I think most like frameworks or you know, certain companies I've worked at, they had a very similar type always somewhere, right? So, so we had boost outcome and juice results and lots of other frameworks have something very, very similar. Um, the difference now, though, is that it's now in the standard. So now, not only do we have this functionality that we probably already had, but we have a vocabulary type which is in the standard, which we can all agree on this is the, the, the way we can do this now. And so the cool thing about that is if different libraries and different APIs agree on you're going to use that expected, then you can do monadic error handling across API boundaries. And that's really, really cool. And this is something you couldn't really do before. And this is where it really impacts C++, I think, in a, in a significant way. Let me, let me show you what I mean. So let's say we have um, a vector of integers, and we want to just add them all up. Okay? This is the stuff at the bottom. And then the way we add them all up is we call std accumulate. That's an algorithm in a standard library. Um, and then at the top is the implementation of std accumulate. That's in the standard library, right? So it just kind of takes two operators. And yes, we can do this with ranges, but you know, this is not the topic of the talk today. Uh, you get the two operators. You just operate, iterate over the whole range, and you call the operation on every element. You kind of add them all up. The operation in this case is, is addition. Um, and so, so this is straightforward, but what do we have, what if we want to handle uh, integer overflows, right? So signed integers can overflow, that's undefined behavior. If we add up a million integers, that's maybe going to happen. So you want to catch, catch that case. You want to catch the case of integers overflowing. 
would still accumulate. How can we do this today? So what you want to do is you want the accumulate to basically short circuit if there is integer overflow and just abort what it's doing and, and just return an error, okay? And so with std accumulate, the only way we can do this today is we can throw exceptions because std accumulate has no other way to terminate the loop, okay? So the only way we can do this is we can pass our own custom addition, which we can do with the lambda here, um, and just check for the overflow manually and for the underflow as well. And then if that happens, throw an exception. And then that's gonna, that's gonna short circuit the accumulate, but then again, we're paying for all the overhead of exceptions and there are situations where you don't wanna do that. And so what's that expected, what we can do is we can define our addition in such a way that instead of returning the kind of added integer, it returns an expected of an integer or a numeric error, okay? So this is now the new return type for our lambda. And now, whenever the error happens, we just return a std unexpected. And now, in the accumulate implementation, the way we modify this is that we say, well, we're gonna apply the operation, we're gonna add up the next two integers, but then that's gonna give us an expected, that's the lambda, and then we're gonna check um, if that's a, a value, and then we just continue. But if there's no value, we have an error, and then we just return the error back out, right? So we terminate the loop, and we just return the error. And so the only ugly thing about this is that um, accumulate actually can have a different, uh, the type of the return can be different from the type of the numbers that you're adding, right? So you can add num integers, but then get a long out or something. So what we need to do is we need to, um, this is the kind of ugly bit of template metaprogramming here, is we, we have to take the return value of the lambda, which is like int or expect or error, like expected of int or error, unpack the return type of the lambda, take the error out, construct a new expected type and put with the value type of the accumulate and put the same error type back in there. So this is kind of the ugly template metaprogramming here. The only reason it's ugly is because I really wanted to fit this on one slide. If you factor this out into its own meta function, you can make it a little, like a lot nicer, but then it's gonna be, it's gonna be longer. Um, and so the really interesting thing here is note that the error type never appears at the top. The top doesn't care about what the error type is. It's completely generic on what the error type is. It's just a still expected of something and something. Okay, so, so this is kind of generic uh, uh, kind of error propagation across API boundaries where the different libraries don't care about what the error type is. You can do that with expected. I think that's really cool. Okay, now you might, you might think, okay, what is this numeric error thing here? So is this like a base class of these two errors here? And wouldn't this mean that we get slicing because we now pass only the base class? If, and so yes. Don't do this with inheritance. We can do something a lot better. We can make numeric error a variant of the different errors um, that, that we can get. And we can stick that variant into the expected. And that's a really, really powerful pattern that allows you to do something else, which is really cool. So um, it allows you to um, have like different types of errors and different layers of your stack. Let's say, I don't know, we have a uh, parser, we implement a parser for some kind of language, and then we have on different levels of the thing, we can have different errors. We can have a file read error, and then later we got the file, you're parsing it, so we can have a parse error. And so what you can do is you can just kind of accumulate these different errors in a variant, and then pass it up, um, and then at the point where you, um, you, you, you do the error handling, um, the happy path, you just check if there is a value, if there is, you just do your processing, but if there is an error now, you can, you can have to do this visit on the variant. We saw this earlier, right? And then we can have different lambdas or function objects handling the different error cases. You can do this with visit, and this is actually really nice. Um, and so, so the cool thing is also that visit actually forces you to implement all the overloads. So now, maybe you have a new layer somewhere in your, in your stack where maybe you get your code that you wanna pass from the network and then that can error out and so you introduce a network error somewhere deep in your stack. So then you just add that to your variant and then you're gonna get compiler errors all the way up and you have to add this network error everywhere. And then at the site where you do error handling, you also get an error because you need to add the network error here as well. Um, and so you, you add a lambda here uh, to handle this case, you can't forget to handle this case. 
because the compiler is not going to let you. And here you can either handle the network or you can rethrow the error, right, and pass it further up. And so um, this kind of looks like try catch now, right? Except you don't pay for any of the overhead of exceptions. It's all very, very efficient. So this actually is most similar to probably something like Java checked exceptions, if anybody's familiar with that. Um, how do I put this? It's not universally accepted that this is the best error handling mechanism in the world. Let's put it diplomatically. But there are cases where this is a good way of doing it. And, and now, as it expected, let's, let's you do it in this way. So there's actually one more thing. Um, there's these monadic functions for expected, which optional has and, and, and expected now also has them. And then, or else, transform, and then also transform error and error or. That lets you kind of chain things like that. So, you know, you can, uh, this is like a, from the paper, you can, you can have a expected, and then if, 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 if it's an error, you can just have a continuation where you do something with the error, or if it's a value, uh, you do something with the value, and it kind of short circuits whenever you have an error. Here, here's a kind of more real world example here from John, John Wakeley. You can, you can give it kind of lambdas at each stage, and it's going to pass the value into the lambda or the error into the lambda, and you can write these continuations. And so we thought for a while that we wouldn't get this in C23. Um, it would have to wait for C26. But actually, at, in Kona at the meeting last week, we uh, actually voted this into C23. So this stuff actually did get into C23 after all, at the last minute. we. We added it. So, so I'm very happy about that. So now it's also consistent with optional, which also has these. So that's expected. And I, I hope, I expect that it's going to pop up in uh, many different code bases because it's a very good error handling mechanism in many cases. All right. Um, come to the third section of the talk MD span. And MD span, that's my personal favorite. That is literally my favorite feature in C++23. Um, and so if you do anything that has to do with uh, scientific computing or graphics or, I don't know, signal processing or any other kind of number crunching, this is really, really, really cool and, and it's going to change everything. So um, this is a paper that's been in development for also a very long time. It went through 18 revisions. It has a very long list of authors. People have worked on this for a long time. And then we didn't get it into 17. We just about didn't get it into C++20, but then it turns out that there's a lot more work to be done. And then we did manage, finally, to get it into C++23, and now it's on the standard, and it's really, really awesome. And let me tell you why MD Span is awesome. I need to like, rewind a little bit, tell you a little bit of a personal story. So this is me, many, young me, many years ago. This is before I worked on IDEs or developer tools, and this was before I was doing music software. This was actually before I knew anything about C++. Um, so at the time, I was in, in, um, working in astrophysics. Um, so this is the Leibniz Institute for Astrophysik in Potsdam, which is where I used to work many, many uh, years ago. And um, it's not so far from here. And, and so, so um, the things we were doing there were these numerical simulations of, of the universe, basically. Um, and so, so the idea here is, you look at um, large-scale structure of the universe, so like galaxies and, and beyond, kind of galaxy clusters and like kind of the really big uh, large-scale structure. So, so what you do is you, you want to have a numerical simulation of how the large-scale structure of the universe evolves. So what you do is you have a, a box, like you have a cubic box, which is hundreds of millions of light years across, so like one galaxy is basically one pixel in there. And then uh, you put in some initial conditions, which you get from the cosmic microwave background, some kind of Gaussian noise. Uh, with some constraints in there, and then you put in, uh, you say, this is just, just gas, and then you put in the equations for hydrodynamics, for how gas behaves. That's the one thing. The next thing you put in is um, the equations for gravity, so this gas is kind of self-gravitating. And the third thing you put in is cosmic expansion, because the universe expands. And then you just throw all that in, you get a bunch of differential equations, you can solve them numerically. And then you just evolve the system, and you get something like this. And then you, you look at this and see if it looks anything like you know, the large-scale structure we see with the telescope. And if it does, then your theory is correct, and you can write papers about it and all of that stuff. And so, so I've been doing this for a while. And, and so we have these, um, sorry, I have not been doing this for a while now, but I used to do this many years ago. 
Um, and so what you do there is you have this 3D box and you track quantities like density, velocity, and stuff like that. And so, so uh, you need lots of arrays, multidimensional arrays. You have 1D arrays, 2D arrays, 3D arrays. Most commonly you actually have, in this particular use case, 4D arrays. Uh, because you have 3D and then the fourth dimension is what's the quantity you're looking at? Is it density? Is it temperature? And so on. And so later I found out I went into audio. It's the same thing. You have like samples and, and channels and frames and it's essentially it's just a 2D array of audio data. And then if you go to image processing, it's, there's also lots of multidimensional arrays there. So it's kind of, you, you, you need this stuff. And so when I was doing astrophysics back, back in the day, I didn't know anything about C++, that wasn't really a thing. Um, I was studying physics, and so everybody around me was using Fortran, so I was also using Fortran. So Fortran was actually the first programming language that I learned. I was never meant to become a programmer, that came later. I just had to deal with Fortran at the time, so that was my first programming language. And here's how you deal with multidimensional arrays in Fortran. Who, who here knows Fortran or has done stuff with Fortran? Okay, yeah, a few people, okay, cool. So, so this is Fortran 95, this is what I was using at the time. So multidimensional arrays in Fortran are actually really cool because it's a built-in data type. It's na native data type. So programming with multidimensional arrays in Fortran is actually really beautiful. Here's how you declare a 3D array. And then you have a loop, and then you loop over the array, and then you do something. Like in this case, we write some number into every element that has something to do with the indices. It doesn't really matter, but you just kind of loop over the whole thing. And um, so this is nice. Because it's a native data type, you can just multiply the whole 3D array with a number, and it's going to multiply every element with that number. You just, you know, write that out. You don't have to write a loop. It just does it. You can, you can print the whole thing. And again, that's just natively supported. So that's actually nice, because C++23, we got formatted output for ranges now, new in C++23. That's, that's one of the like, newest ranges things that I didn't talk about that we just got in C++23. Well, guess what? Fortran could do it in the 60s. <laughs> right, so, <laughs> um, so this is a static array. Um, we can also have a dynamic array allocated on the heap, so you just say it's allocatable, and then you allocate it and then you use it, you don't have to worry about deleting it again, it's gonna automatically do it when it goes out of scope. So, so arrays and Fortran are really beautiful. And now then, so I was doing this for a while and then I changed projects uh, within this Astrophysics Institute and, and I got to work on a code base that was written in C. So that was the, the only other language that anybody in that field was using at the time. It was either Fortran or C. And, for, and C was kind of the weird new one. And <laughs> So, um, and so, uh, so this is how you, this is how you use static multidimensional arrays uh, in C. This is okay, right? But, but um, if you want to do dynamic arrays in C, this is how I was taught by my supervisor to do multidimensional arrays in C. And this pattern was all over the code base. There was like 100 repetitions of this all over the whole, the whole code. And so you have to, you have to, uh, declare this pointer to pointer to pointer if you have three dimensions and then you have to do this loop where you malloc every dimension like kind of in a particular way and to this day it breaks my brain like in what order to do this and how to write this loop and I can't quite get it right. And then this is the code that actually does anything useful. This is just our loop as before. And then you have to free, because it's C, you have to manually free every dimension in the reverse order in which you allocate it in, right? So that's quite horrible. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, much later I found out this isn't even in C, this is not a great way to do this. Like, because you have these two problems here, you, you have so, uh, these like multiple indirections, right, because you have pointer to pointer to pointer, and the other problem is that your data is probably not going to be contiguous because you do these like separate uh, mallocs there. So in C, a much cleverer way to do this would be to um, allocate a 1D array, which is gonna be the whole data, which is this thing here, and then you, you iterate over it with 3D indices and you just pretend that it is a 3D array, right? And then you have this formula there, how to get from the 3D indices that you're looping over to the 1D index and the, and the 1D array that you actually allocated, right? So this is kind of the, the formula there. And so if you're now not in C but in C++, then you can say, okay, so I can maybe make it a class and I can 
stick this formula into an operator param paran, and you just give the indices you know, as parameters to that operator. And it's going to return your reference to the correct element. And then you stick that whole thing to a class, and you make that class a template. You template it on the uh, um, value, on the, on the uh, element type. And then you have some kind of multi-array uh, template, class template. Who here has written a class like this? OK, that's like half of the room. I have written this type of thing maybe five times in my career. Um, it gets really fun if you want to template it also on the number of dimensions, because then all your functions are like variadic templates. And then if, you have, if some of your extents are known at compile time, you want to get the optimizations, right? Because you know how long the dimension is, and then you, like, everything becomes const explorer as well. And then it becomes really fun, and like, it becomes really hard to do this, right? And so, so the cool thing about NVSpan is that they basically solved all the problems in this space, and we don't have to worry about it ever again. We can just use it in, in the standard. And so um, earlier this year, Bjarne actually wrote an email to the uh, mailing list of the C++ committee, and he gave me permission to put this here on the slide. He was like, can anyone recommend a Chris tutorial for MD Span?" And he followed it up with an email saying, what I really like is a short introduction for non-experts. And so, um, so here's my attempt. This is my uh, attempt at a short 10-minute introduction to MD Span. So let's say, again, we, we, have, uh, we have allocated a 1D array. This is just a block of data, OK? So it's still the same as in the C example. And now what we can do is we can create an MD span, which is going to wrap this data and look at it as if it were a 3D array. So we just declare an MD span, we give it a pointer to the data, and then we give it the, four, the three uh, extents of the three dimensions. Okay? And then we can just use it. We can, we can write our loop. And so there's three things that are interesting about this. Um, one is it heavily relies on CTAT, class template argument deduction. So you don't have to write MD span, angle brackets, blah, 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 blah. Um, it's just going to deduce it automatically from, from the, the, com the constructor arguments. This is number one. Uh, number two is it uses the multidimensional square bracket operator, which is a new thing in C23. So this is an example where we added a core language feature to support a library feature, which we don't do that very often, but this is one of those examples. And you can use this also now for, for your own classes, right? You have this square bracket operator with, uh, with multiple indices. Like previously, you couldn't do this. You could do square bracket operators kind of multiple in a row, but it was really difficult. You had to like pass around these proxy types, and if anybody has done this, this was not nice. And so, so now you have this. This is much better. And the third thing that's important here is that MD span doesn't own the data. So MD span is like, is like span, you know, it's, but the multidimensional version of it. So it's just it's a view into the data, basically, but it's not owning it. So the, the, the array is actually allocated outside. So you can have a different MD span looking at the same data and pretending it was a 2D array with a different shape, and as long as it's the same kind of size of underlying data, it's, it's going to work just fine. You have this dot rank function, which is going to give you the number of dimensions, so three or two in this case. And then you have this extents uh, object. So you can specify the extents, um, and you can do it explicitly. And this is really, so, so if, if, you, if you just want to give it the extents, you can do it like that. But this is very interesting if you have a mixture of static and dynamic extents. So some of your extents are known at compile time. Others are only known at runtime. And so now you can uh, create this extends object explicitly. You can say, OK, so the index type is int. It's very important. It's not the element type. It's the index type. Uh, you can actually use signed integers in there. So you can have negative indices. This is also, you can do cool stuff with this. It's a different topic. Um, so we have int, uh, indices. And the, the first dimension is size 4. The second is size 4. And the third one is runtime size. And then you just pass that into the MD span when you construct it. Or you can also uh, put that in as a, as a template parameter. That's the other thing you can do. And, um, and then you can construct the MD span, and you can give it the pointer in either only the extents of the dimensions that are known at runtime, like this, and, and the static ones that are already known. Or you can give it um, all three extents again. But then you have to make sure that the, the ones you specify for the static dimensions are actually match the ones that you uh, specified as a static extent, otherwise you get UB, so you need to be careful with that. 
Um, and so uh, there's also this case when audio extents are dynamic, and then instead of typing this out, you have this very handy type def d extents, which means all extents are dynamic, so you just give it um, the index type and the number of dimensions. And so uh, MDSpine actually has four template arguments. Um, the first one is the element size, uh, sorry, the element type, so that's pretty obvious. The second one is the extents. We just talked about this. The third one is also very interesting. That's the layout policy, and that's basically how you get from the multidimensional indices in the MB span to the one-dimensional index in the underlying array. So that's this formula of how you get from i, j, k to like the index and in the underlying data. And so there's different layouts that are possible, right? So there's you know, these two, they're very popular. We have in C and C++, we have row major order, where kind of the last dimension is the contiguous one. And then in Fortran, it's the other way around. We have column major order. And so um, anybody who's used both languages knows that kind of you have this, they're doing it in this opposite way. And so MD Span calls them layout right and layout left. And why did they not call them row major order and column major order? Well, actually, it does make sense. Uh, in row major order, which one is the fastest running dimension, the one that's contiguous? It's the rightmost one, right? The one at the very right. That's the dimension that's going to be the, the contiguous one, the fastest running one. So it's layout right. In uh, column major order, which dimension is the fastest running one? It's the leftmost one, so it's layout left. So I think it's pretty easy to remember. So we can just use a custom layout. We, can just, we have a bunch of standard layouts. So we have layout right, that's the default. You can check what's going on. We have this dot stride, which gives you the stride of every dimension. You notice here that the, the last dimension has stride one, so that's the contiguous one. If you do layout left, this is what you want to do if you get the array from Fortran. You do layout left, and then the first dimension is the one that has stride one. But then you need to be careful that if you loop over it, um, like in C++, you need to invert the loop, right? You need to invert which index is where. Otherwise, you're going to be not looping contiguously, and that's going to be slow. So uh, we have a bunch of standard layouts, but you can also customize it. You can write your own layout, and that's really, really cool, because depending on your use case, um, if you do image processing, maybe you want to do some kind of tile layout, because you just look at you know, one part of your image at a time, and then this is going to be the most cache-friendly way you can, you can do that. right? So you want to implement a layout like this. Or there's other layouts, like there's a Hilbert curve. It's another mapping from multiple dimensions into one dimension. This is a two-dimensional Hilbert curve. This is a three-dimensional Hilbert curve. And when I was doing these astrophysics simulations, we actually had 3D Hilbert curves in there. And I wish we had MD span back then, because it would have made it so much easier to write this. Um, and those layouts, they don't even have to be um, contiguous. They don't even have to be unique. You can have you know, different indices mapping into the same place in memory. For example, if you have something like a symmetric matrix, right? so, so that you have a top half and the bottom half, and they kind of store the same stuff. So, so you can only store the bottom half in memory, and whenever anybody indexes into the top half, you just redirect them to the bottom half, and then you only need half the memory. right? So that's very efficient. And so, so I actually went in and, and implemented, just as an exercise, I just implemented this uh, kind of symmetric matrix. I just stored the bottom half layout, because I just wanted to know how to do it. And I just sat down with basically just the paper, the MD span paper, and the reference implementation of MD span from Cocos. And it took me about an hour to figure this out. So it's not difficult. It's not black magic. And so I wrote this code. This is literally like if you copy paste it into the compiler, it's it's literally going to work. This is like the, the the code that I got to work. So so what you have to do is you have to write this layout class and you just can plug it into MD span as a third template parameter. So you, because it's a matrix, I, I say now okay, it has to be two dimensional. I only care about two dimensional matrices in this case. So I have a requires clause rank as two, and then uh, here I need to make sure that it's um, it's symmetric. I do this trick here where um, if all extents are known at compile time, so the number of dynamic extents is zero, then we can do a static assert that they're the same. If at least one dimension is only known at runtime, you need to do a runtime assert that the extents are equal, right? So it's a square matrix. That's the thing you need to check here. It's a square matrix that the two extents are, are equal. And then scrolling down, this is the magic. This is the formula, how you map from the top half into the bottom half. You just swap the indices if it's the top half. And then this is the formula that gets you into the right place in the contiguous array. Um, and then there's a little bit of boilerplate I had to write 
to tell the MD span um, the required span size. That's like the, the size of the underlying array, which it needs to know. And then there's these other thingies to let it know whether the layout is unique, exhaustive, and strided. Uh, so exhaustive means every combination of indices maps somewhere, and unique is uh, like two combinations of indices map into a different place in memory, which is false in this case. Um, and this works. This compiles this works. If you would put it into a library, you would need to make it a little bit more complete. You would probably have a copy constructor and operator equals equals and assignment and all of this stuff. Um, in my case, I didn't need that because my test code didn't use those things, but you probably want to wanna add those too if, if, if you want to put it in the library or something like that. Um, and so this is the third template argument of MB span, and this is really, really cool. There is a fourth um, argument here, which is the default access, uh, sorry, the accessor policy, and that's um, if you then found your element, how do you access it? And the default accessor just returns your reference to, to that, that element. But you might want to do something else there. You might want to access it through an atomic ref if you want to do it from multiple threads in a weight-free way or... Um, GPU people use it to access data on the GPU, and you can write your custom accessor for that. And so th that's also really powerful, and I would say um, accessors for known owning types like span, MD span, they're kind of like allocators for owning types like containers. It's most of the time you don't have to worry about them, uh, but if you do have a use case where you need to customize that, you really, really need to because there's no other way to do it. So, so that's really cool. This is MD span. Uh, there's talks that go into more detail. Uh, there's a talk by Bryce Lelbach, uh, who did a talk earlier this year, one hour just about MD span. I think, uh, was it Nevin Lieber who did a talk uh, about MD span at this year's CppCon? Uh, so there's kind of more material about this popping up. So if you do want to dive deeper, you can do that. For example, here Bryce, he talks about how to use MD span in algorithms, why MD span doesn't have iterators, and what you do instead. And, it's it's a it's deep topic. So if you're interested, watch these talks. Um, there's also another feature coming up in C++ 26, uh, which didn't make it for 23, which is MD array. That's the owning version. So MD array is to MD span what vector is to span. Right. This is like the owning version. And I'm very happy that so we're going to hopefully get this in C++ 26. But I'm very happy that we standardized the non-owning version first because this is the more generic one. Right. If you have an array that comes from a piece of Fortran code. You can do it with a non-owning version, but this one is not going to be very helpful. So we got the generic kind of non-owning version um, um, in C++23, and that's really cool. And with this, we come to the last, uh, promise you, not very long part of my talk, which is the print. And the print is, is going to change the world, quite literally, because it's going to change how we write Hello World. You know, we didn't change that for 30 years or something, so this is really, really, really exciting. This is a paper by uh, Viktor Zverevic, um, and that paper also went through many, many revisions, 14 revisions, and was in development for quite a while, like all the other features that I've talked about today. And so, yeah, this is, this is going to change Hello World. This is, this is really cool. So if you open any programming book about C++, obviously Hello World is the first thing you're going to see. Um, this is, uh, I just took Bjarne's, Bjarne's book. And this is literally the first code snippet in that book. It is Hello World. And Hello World is everywhere. If I open up my favorite IDE and I just uh, open a new project, right? So I say, I want a C++ executable, and this is what I get. So again, Hello World. That's like the default program that does something, right? So interestingly, c -Line gives me something slightly different than Bjarne's book. It adds the std endl here and the return zero, whereas Bjarne um, has uh, backslash n and no return, so let's not talk about those things. Um, let's talk about what else is wrong with this code. So let's see out. Let's do a code review here. So what, what, what's wrong here? So so Stutzi out has quite a few problems. So Stutzi out is notorious for bad performance, right? It, it's slow. It has this really weird interface as well, like it has this left shift operator and it has this like zoo of IO manipulators uh, that you kind of need to know about. So for example, if you print a bool, what is this going to print? One, exactly, it prints one. What do you need to do to make it print true? Yeah, good, std bool alpha. What header is std bool alpha in? 
Mayo Manip, no, it's not. It's an include IO stream, actually. But others, like stud w, which is the one you need to set the field with, that's an IO Manip. So you kind of have to remember this. This is really, really uh, uh, kind of awkward. Um, so it's the bool alpha. But that's not even the worst bit. The worst bit is this. So if I do this in English, um, it's obviously going to print hello world, but English is not my first language. English is not my second language. German is my second language, but German is also not my first language. My first language is actually Russian. I, I was born in Russia, and so if I want to write hello world in my mother tongue, what am I going to get? So. On macOS, it's going to print the right thing. On Windows, I get this. <laughs> and I didn't make this up. I copy-pasted this from, uh, from what's actually happened. So this is my Mac here. This works. But I have a Windows machine at home. And I tried this. And this is literally what happened. And I just copy-pasted that into the slide. So this is what it actually prints. So what's going on here? So uh, we have the source encoding. We have the execution encoding. So the source encoding, in this case, is UTF-8. The execution encoding is probably UTF-8 or UTF-16, depending on which compiler flags you're using with Visual Studio. But actually, uh, it doesn't matter what compiler flags I'm using, because uh, I don't get a useful output in any case, because um, it gets sent to the terminal. The terminal doesn't care about either the source encoding or the execution encoding. The, the terminal is page, code page 437. And code page 437 is, you, you get this. And, and yeah, basically, so it stood out just takes the string, uh, set, uh, sends it over as a bag of bytes, and then the terminal does with it whatever it wants. And on Windows, it does, it does that. And so, so that's very unfortunate. You know, this, this is kind of one of the reasons why the Python people laugh at us, right? Because they're, you know, it, it's, it just works. Okay? So, so uh, we kind of partially solved the problem in C++20. Uh, we introduced that format. And that format does a lot of things right. It does handle Unicode properly. This is good. It does handle things like the bool. It prints bool. It does the right thing. If you want it to print one instead of true, you, you have a syntax for format specifiers, which is you know, similar to printf, but different. You use this colon, but it can do everything printf can do and more. Right? So it's a modern version of that, so you can print I don't know, std chrono days of the week or whatever. And it just works out of the box with std format. And you can also write your own custom formatters. And it's a beautiful library. Um, it's also a lot safer than printf. So if, for example, so printf, you know, if, if you, it's run, runtime var args, right? So if you omit an argument, then you get like weird undefined behavior or security vulnerabilities or stuff like that. Uh, std format gives you a uh, compile error. Right? So it's all checked at compile time. And the other nice thing is the IO stream always puts, uh, like pulls in locales, which is a nightmare if you care about binary size. So the format doesn't use locales at all. By default, you have to explicitly specify that you want to use a locale. Uh, you can, you can uh, specify that uh, by explicitly passing it a locale. And only then does it care about locales. And yes, it's going to do the right thing. It does have support for it. But it's opt-in rather than opt-out, or rather opt-in rather than you have to have it. And you have to have all this junk in your binary. Um, and so, so, so std format is great, but um, we can now reasonably deal with strings and Unicode and all of that inside our app. But in C++20, we still don't have any way to get it out. How do we print this? So what you end up doing is you end up doing this in the end again, right? So, so this, is the, this, is the, this is one way to get the, the string out in C++20. And that's just not great for many reasons, right? So first of all, you're creating a temporary string, which you don't need. And then you call uh, operator left shift left shift, which is a function call that you don't need. And then uh, you have already a formatted string. And then you do formatted output on a string that's already formatted. And that's also kind of just a waste of CPU cycles. It's, it's not a good solution. And, and you can do this more efficiently, but then you have to go deep and know what you're doing, and it becomes ugly and complicated. In C++23, everything's great, because we have std print. And it's just going to do the right thing. And we can forget about IO streams and never, never mention them again. And so std print is just going to do the right thing. And it's even going to do the right thing on Windows with the terminal, because if you look into the standard, the way it's specified is that it says, well, if you have Unicode and, and you are on something that can handle Unicode, then it will call the correct system-specific API, which Windows has for the terminal, um, 
to display, you know, to handle that Unicode. So, so you get consistent glyphs whenever you, it's possible on all of, across all of these systems, uh, and even in the Windows terminal, so, so it just works. And so the other nice thing about the print is that it kind of, it's built on top of that format, so all of the nice things about that format just automatically transfer to that sprint. Right. So yes, it handles Unicode. It has the same language for um, format descriptors as format has. It has the same um, kind of safety in the sense that arguments are checked at compile time. <laughs> Excuse me. Arguments are checked at compile time. You have the same thing that it doesn't pull in locales unless you really want to. Um, and another nice thing that it has, it can also print to other streams, not just to stutzi out. You can give it stutzi or whatever other stream as a um, first optional kind of, that's a different overload first argument, and then it's going to print to that, that stream, right? So, so, so print solves all these problems, and we don't have to ever, ever mention Stutzi out again. So, so this is actually the new Hello World. We changed in CLS Trinity how, how you write Hello World, how, except actually uh, we changed it twice, because as we learned from Daniela this morning, we now have standard library uh, modules, so we can also get rid of the hash include and instead write import std. And so this is the new Hello World. Except that um, there's actually one more thing. You still have to backslash n in there, right? So it still doesn't print the, the, the kind of new line character at the end automatically. But we do have a thing for that now as well in C23. We have std print line, and that's going to automatically print a new line for you as well, and we have that too. So um, I'm actually really curious which one of the two should be like the new canonical way of writing Hello World. Maybe we can do a quick vote. Who likes the first version? Okay, a couple people. Who, who like the, likes the second version? All right, so, so okay, that's very unanimous. So I hereby declare the second version the new official way to write Hello World in C++. And that is how C++ 23 changes the way you write code. Thank you, and I think I overran even the 90 minutes that Jens gave me, so apologies, and I guess we don't have time for questions, but I'll be around. Uh, you can find me at the JetBrains booth all day tomorrow as well, so please talk to me, and thank you. And apologies for keeping you here for so long.